All right, I am live. I'm live with John uh, Paniski. Paniski, correct? Correct. Correct. Good. Uh, some folks, as they come in, let's see, nobody's quite in yet, um, but I always try to make sure I get the pronunciation rights. And John, sometimes as we go, uh, I'll pause at a moment. We'll, we may get some comments off to the side. You may not be able to see them, but as some of the comments come in, I will be able to maybe throw them up on the screen like so. I'll try not to do that too often because I've found it can actually be um, a distraction for the, the guest that's on. So, But we'll take some questions as people come in. Um, Maybe they're out doing yard work right now, which is what some of my neighbors are. I'll let you know and the guests know as well. My my grandkids are here, so you may hear them upstairs every once in a while. They generally won't come down, but no guarantees. <laughs> so, John, where are you remoting in from? I'm calling you from Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. And as I explained before, Waynesboro is a town that is located exactly between uh, the battlefields of Gettysburg and Antietam, uh, about uh, 25 minutes north and 25 minutes south. Wow. We were, we were actually occupied um, by Confederate troops for 10 days um, during the Gettysburg campaign. Mm. Now, do you tour the, uh, the battlefields frequently, or which one do you think you toured the most? Oh, definitely Gettysburg. Um, but I've been to both a number of times uh, to Antietam on their uh, their grand anniversary, where I met uh, Jeffrey Shara's uh, um, son. Hmm. It was uh, it's a pretty interesting time because there were many reenactors there, and something you rarely see balloon reenactors. Really. Just for the observational time, I would imagine, is what they were used for artillery spotting and such? Yes, it was a guy that was um, uh, pretending to be Mr. Lowe. Hmm. Very cool. That would be nice. Now, was he taking people up as well, or how did that all work? Not while I was there. <laughs> I've never... My wife's done some balloon rides when she was in Albuquerque. I guess they've, they've got a ton of, for whatever reason, hot air balloons there. I've never been up. I don't know. I'm, I will admit to a little bit of heights don't bother me until you get up about 30 feet. I don't like doing like Christmas decorations on the roof. <laughs> My wife gets on me all the time. <laughs> For our anniversary, um, I guess it was seven or eight years ago. Uh, my wife and I went up in a balloon over the Shenandoah mm. and it was glorious. Absolutely glorious. Really? All right. Well, I'll have to open my, my mind a little bit if I get a chance to do that. That would be great. We do have uh, Kabuki Kid has joined us. She's saying, yes, we're live. Welcome. Yeah, she says, uh, hi, Chief, and hi, John. So she's in Kabuki. She is awesome. Great gamer. Now, what we'll be doing with John here, of course, uh, John is a designer of several games. I've got one here that I picked up. Whoop, get the glare off of it. Just recently, Bleeding Kansas. Uh, being in Wichita, Kansas. Um, as soon as I was researching you, John, of course, uh, Plains Indian Wars is what we'll be talking about a lot as well, getting ready to come out from GMT. Um, and uh, when we get into that, I'll talk about how gorgeous it looks and the interesting gameplay. But as I was researching you, I see, whoa, bleeding Kansas. And I knew, I knew about the pre-Civil War action between Missouri and Kansas and uh, immediately ordered the game. I've read the rules in the history, but I haven't sat down and played it yet because I've been going on some trips and doing some different things with Summer. But uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about Bleeding Kansas as well. So um, one thing to start with, I always love, I know from looking up your bio and our little chat that uh, um, I think you're retired now, correct me if wrong, but you're a, or were a teacher of English and social studies along with a lot of other things. Do you want to give a little bit of your bio for everybody? Sure. Out of high school, I joined the Marines. I was involved in the evacuations of Phnom Penh and Saigon. Mm. Uh, when I got out, I met my, actually met my wife before I got out of the Marines. She was in the Air Force. Um, together, we have lived in... Um, I believe six states, um, three different places in Pennsylvania, which is where I am now. 
Um, but I've also run a, uh, a landscaping business on Long Island. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I ran a uh, murder mystery business, uh, which we've operated in New York, Pennsylvania. Um, what else? Uh, I was a reporter in Florida on a, on a daily on the Gulf Coast. Mm. And um, since retiring from uh, being a social studies teacher in an alternative school, I have begun writing a 15 book series on the Civil War. I'm currently wow. on book six. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, when you were in the Marines, were you a, was, is a 311 a rifleman? Yeah, I was what was called a grunt. Uh -huh. um, slogged along with a with a rifle and um it was it was quite interesting i loved i loved being in the marines um and i probably would have stayed um but when i came up for re-enlistment uh my current captain said that i was too democratic <laughs> that sounds like the marines <laughs> i've had a few friends that made uh but they're an E4 corporal, Lance Corporal. And uh, my one buddy said the other thing the Marines were real good about was we would love to make you an E5, but you're going to have to re-enlist for at least another four. And he was like, man, I don't think I want to do another four. So, but, uh, and and then you also did, you designed Hearts and Minds, the Vietnam game, correct? Yes, yeah. it was, it, it was um, on my mind when I first started designing um, Although Lincoln's War was was the thing that I really wanted to get out the door first, mm. but Hearts and Minds was was close behind. And um, interestingly enough, uh, the original it, it was based um, largely on Mark Herman's um, "We the People," sure. uh, my my absolute favorite game. Um, and I tried to fit it into that that milieu by calling it. Screw the people. <laughs> the name didn't go over too well. <laughs> yeah, it's a great design, John, but hold on. We're going to have our developer work on the name a little bit. <laughs> Let me see. We've got a few more people that have popped in here. We've got uh, Uva Beck is in. Hi, John and Bart. Uh, thank you both for your service. Well, thank hey, you. Uwe. Yeah, thanks, Uva. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Vorpal comes in. Uh, Vorpal loves Vietnam games. He's a, he's usually in when I do lives. He says we need a new war game, Rescue of the Americans in Cabal. Yeah, that's that's. I was progress. actually giving that some some thought, Vorpal. Um, there are a lot of of um, subjects that you have to be very careful of. I, I learned that real early on. Um, I believe that this is one that's worthy of of a, um, of a of a not a war game, but simply a a rescue game. Mm. Sure. And if Vietnam happens to be your your favorite subject, then I really encourage you to try out Hearts and Minds. It's a lot of fun. Excellent. Yeah, he loves, loves Vietnam. He's always on. And actually, Vietnam, um, I think it's because it can be so difficult to figure out how to approach it, how to game it. And, it, it you know, it's never gotten as much, obviously, World War II. There's, there's you know, you know, games always coming out on World War II. And then I would say American Civil War is probably one of the other most popular. Yeah. But, uh, what, when I so, started on, on um, Hearts and Minds. Exactly. Uh, I, I wanted to approach it from a political point of view, which mm. is how I approached the Civil War with Lincoln's War. Um, hearts, and, hearts and Minds initially um, had two fronts. I wanted to include the, the protests on a much larger scale mm. um, than was actually um, done in the final game. But I still managed to work some of it in. Interesting. Kind of just like the will of the people at home, that the the concept. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. And that does play on the morale of the the American player. Yeah, uh, wonderful. 
hundred percent. Uh, very, very interesting. Huh. Well, you've got me interested in that. I was looking at a few more of these. Let's see. There's some. Ah, Vorpal says, uh, I own hearts and minds. Oh, good on you. <laughs> yeah, so Vorpal's in. Um, let's see. FYI, John, my other war game uh, idea was the crew of the USS Indianapolis versus the Sharks. <laughs> oh, goodness. I see, Vorpal I understand um, your interest in that. And, and I actually gave that some thought as well. Uh, but I also think that it's too dark. Yes. Well, you can see he's got his old Jaws thing on the side there. So, And Vorpal has a biting wit. He's usually calling me ugly, so Vorpal's being nice today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even Kabuki came on with, oof, Vorpal, come on, Vorpal. That's what he likes to do. That's what he likes to do. So let's come back over to um, uh, Plains Indian Wars. Um, I will share up, let me see, let me do a real quick, I've got a screenshot here, I think I'm going to have to come over, I was trying to set this up, well, that's not going to rotate, this was the uh, lead of the rule book, let me remove that, come back to this, um, I will put up the map in a second, but why don't you um, break down um, Exactly. I've seen the game. I've just perused the rules and the and the play turns. Could you walk us through or walk the uh, viewers through how it's going to play out? Sure. Um, I think it was probably about 10 years ago um, when I <clears throat> played a, a couple of Academy games, Cube, Cube games, and I got the idea for two designs, uh, both of which I presented to them, neither of which they took. Mm. This, was, this was one of them. Um, it is a, um, it is trying to represent the conflict between um, European movement west across the plains. And it mirrors um, several of the aspects of um, the, the Academy Cube games in that it does use cubes. It does have um, minimal card hands. Um, and it ends when one of the players finishes out his card and has played the last card. Hmm. But there are uh, several unique aspects to it. Um, number one, it can be a um, one, two, three, or four player game. Um, Excellent solitaire versions, four of them, in fact, have been developed by a Cajun friend of mine from Louisiana. Um, one player, if it, if it is a two-player game, one player will play the cavalry and the settlers, uh, where the other side will play the Northern Plains Indians, known as the NPI, or the Southern Plains Indians, SBI. Mm. Um, the object for the uh, US player is to occupy as much of the plains as possible. The Indians, the exact opposite to prevent that. At the same time, there are enemies of the Indians, uh, known as enemies, to the north, which are the, the Crow and related tribes that, that uh, uh, allied themselves with the, the US troops. And in the south, the Mexicans. So the Northern Plains Indians are dealing with a two-front war. The Southern Plains Indians are dealing with the two-front war. And while all this is going on, um, you're uh, having the covered wagon trains crossing mm -hmm. the plains, uh, following the historical trails. And you are also building the uh, transcontinental railroad from the east and from the west. When the train, uh, uh, the tracks join, that will end the game or when one player runs out of cards. So there's a, there's a lot going on. Um, the cards themselves are very interesting because they're all, uh, they all have historical references. The Indian um, cards represent chiefs from the various tribes uh, represented in the North or in the South. Um, the settler cards represent um, specific historical characters that play in our history. 
and incidents that occurred. Um, the cavalry represents the uh, cavalry officers that, that were represented in the Plains Wars, as well as the forts that were built in the Plains. Um, I will tell you right up front, and, and I'm not kidding, of all of the designs I have done, this rule book seems to be the most complete, the most beautifully uh, put together, and the components, hmm. my God, yeah. <laughs> I am so impressed. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna attempt to share the screen again. The way I had it set up, it wasn't scrolling. And let me see if I can get in and pull this. There we go. Now it'll move. I didn't come in right. Um, you should be able to see that on the side. Yes. Um, so, and this way you can kind of walk us, walk us through. I know it's 16 pages, but uh, beautiful cover for the rule book. Yep. And GMT just does an incredible job of production. Yes. And I know the, um, I, I know many of the principals personally, just wonderful, wonderful people. 100%. Here you can see your card layout, the beauty, the beauty of these cards, the color scheme, um, and even your layout here of the different decks. And the faction dice are, are, um, are specially designed. Um, you'll notice if you can see closely enough that there are weapons on, on some of them. A weapon would be rolling a hit. Mm. Um, there's, uh, I don't see the peace mm -hmm. symbol. There is a treaty symbol on all of the dice. And when both players roll a treaty during combat, then the um, player with more cubes in the combat will then relocate the, the other sides. Basically, they've come to an agreement and the stronger party decides where they go. Excellent. I know I've seen these. I didn't think it was this far down on the scroll because I know there's a close-up of I think the settler die, here we go. So you can see the weapon symbols. Yep. So the broken arrow is the, the treaty symbol. And basically that was um, the accepted symbol for peace. Got it. Let me see if I can even bring that up a little more. Excellent. And then um, a beautiful, what I call the splash page, kind of coming back from comic books size here. There's the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, that's your railhead. There's a beautiful picture of both that and that weapon die on that settler. Mm -hmm. Now, that, the scene that you're seeing there is in the Rockies. Mm -hmm. And where, whereas the uh, track can be laid fairly easily uh, going west out of St. Louis, um, leaving uh, from the west coast, uh, you are having to go through the Rockies, which is much more difficult. So you you are actually rolling and taking a chance. And for any symbol that is rolled on the die, you get to place one of those black cubes, a black cube meaning a completed section of track. Mm. You cannot start using workers to, to build out onto the plains until you get through the Rockies. And that is historically, it, it was much more difficult to build through the Rockies than it was through the plains. Sure. Yeah, a lot of dynamiting and having to work around the, the mountains. Let me see this. Uh, we'll get up to this splash page. Yeah, everything was very nice. Uh, you're right. The development of this just looks gorgeous. So here is also just a little bit. Um, I'll show a bigger picture of the map later. But uh, this, this right-hand corner showing everything from Canada north all the way down to the southern Mexican border here. Can you go down just a little bit more? Sure. And show those, those discs. Yes. This, this is a disc draw game. So you can never be sure which of, of the factions is going to be going next. Mm -hmm. And it is entirely possible um, through through the draw from turn to turn, that a faction could go back to back. Um, it makes for a very interesting game. 
So, and that's a very similar mechanic from that uh, Academy Games Birth of America series. Correct. Uh, perfect, because yeah, now you're, uh, depending on, I, I remember as I played that, sometimes I'm hoping, oh, please draw me last, or you know, wherever you're at, and you end up having to, you get that real nice texture of having to make a decision that almost feels like it's on the fly. You know kind of what you want to do, but you can't necessarily hard and fast your plan. Yep. Now, if you take a look at the center of the map, yes, you'll see those those little ovals. Those uh -huh. are the, the track sections that you're building for the Transcontinental Railroad. To the north and the south of it are the rail trails. The white uh, cubes, which you saw on the lower portion of the map, would move from area to area along the trails. They will always go west. When the Indians attack and they retreat, they always retreat west. Got it. The, the Indian player will gain points for for destroying the trains. The uh, U.S. player gets points for having them reach the Rockies. Hmm. And again, beautiful map and great production. And these look like these are engraved dice as well. Yes. There you go. It's just, just gorgeous. I, I expect this is going to be a very popular game, particularly because of the solitaire versions. Yeah, yeah, always help, helpful. So here's that kind of that splash page, which is nice. Anytime there's that setup that's walking through both the, you know, the numbers, so we know we're talking about faction cards, and then you can come over and see that we're looking at Northern Plains tribes, faction cards, their dice, and their cubes. Beautiful, beautiful development here also on the rules. So very nice. Let me come back to, let's see, I've got to come back to us here. We'll pop back in. There we go. Um, yeah, just looks gorgeous. Um, uh, just to give some of the history, when did you first kind of have this ready to go? Or when did, uh, what's the story with GMT, you know, picking this up? Or how did that all work? I felt that it was ready um, six or seven years ago, okay. um, a very good friend of mine from the Marines, who, who is also a designer, who is actually a designer before me, mm. um, uh, Rick Young. He was one who got me back into gaming uh, my last year in the Marines. Mm. Um, I, I used to be very much into, into board games, uh, but then I got into girls and beer <laughs> and the Marines and sure. So eventually he got me back into it. And when he started designing, um, I followed suit and I had him uh, play this and he actually uh, helped co-design another game with me called Leaping Lemmings. Sure. Uh, 100%. Family game. Yeah. Um, but other than that, uh, this was the only design that he really took to hmm. and, and uh, that gave me a big boost. Yeah. Um, I, I pitched it to Andy and um, uh, it, it was eventually picked up and it's gradually been being developed over the last couple of years. Yeah, I saw it was on the, uh, the P500 for years. And then when you're, I think when the map art kind of hit, it drew. That's it. A number of people were, were not pleased with the original map, and it, and that really bothers me hmm. because when a game first comes out, you're not seeing the final art. Right. You, you should you should look beyond that. Sure. I thought the art for playtest art was was actually very very nice. Bill Morgal was the one who helped uh, work on this with me uh, prior to it going to GMT. And he was very excited about it. And he did wonderful things with the cards and with the map. So I want to give him a shout out. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that gets you in. And then, of course, you know, the the, the very interesting thing about P500 is it is it works as both a bit of an advertising engine as well. You know, hey, here's this potential game. And then, um, you know, where does it catch fire? Because uh, I know, um, oh, heck, um, oh, they've got some weird, it's not a typical GMT game. They're Wizard Academy or Wizard something. I can't remember. And um, 
it's not the typical GMT release, and they're kind of in the same thing. The art's in a roughed out stage, but the folks at GMT think this is going to be something very interesting, but it's definitely not a typical GMT game. So it's had that mixed, you know. Meanwhile, uh, Mark Herman comes out with his new Pacific War, and he keeps telling people, I don't think this is for most gamers. This is a monster, and they just kept piling on, piling on. So, um, but but no, I know that definitely when uh, uh, Jason Carr's been doing a lot too, or maybe it's not just, I know Jason works with the, the uh, GMT-1, the solitaire stuff, but, you know, um, the way they're, they're now um, showing the back of the box when they get that art done, because it kind of does energize that GMT community. So, yeah. um, so what, from your perspective and, uh, you know, what's it like as that GMT P 500 process goes, is it where it's, it's a handoff or are you working with the developer and, and how does that work? Yes, um, I was I was very pleasantly surprised that the people that I worked with Terry Leeds was the um, artist on that, and what a what a nice guy. Hmm. Um, Tony um, put in a, a lot of a lot of input. Um, my gosh, it was reviewed and reviewed and reviewed. That's that's one of the things about uh, getting into designing. Sometimes you get sick of your designs because uh -huh. you go over them so often. But the more often they are gone over, the, the better it is for the player when they finally purchase it. Sure. Yeah. And I know uh, I've talked to Tony Curtis a few times, and he actually lives south of me in Oklahoma. So he also loves, uh, well, I know it's the, it was um, Vietnam, the, the victory games game that they're getting ready to reprint. So I know he was, he was a big fan of that too. He and his wife are some of the nicest people I have ever met. He's great. It's funny. I've talked to him a couple of times and I ran across some of his old articles that he wrote and, uh, you know, way back. And as I saw that, I contacted him and said, Hey, I would love to bring you on and talk about some of the things you did I you love should. the history. Well, he told me, he said, thank you very much. He thought about it for a while. And he said, you know, I'm going to stay in the background. And I he said, is yeah. a very humble man, as yeah. is his wife. Wonderful. Yeah, he just said, I'm going to stay in the background, let some other folks uh, do that. And I said, totally understood. So, yeah, wealth of knowledge, very, very smart man as well. So, um, how... What, what are you working on? Well, let me do a couple things. I always like to ask either what was the first game that got you into gaming? You already kind of touched on a little bit of that, but what game or or system brought you into gaming? And then kind of what are you playing now? What do you play when you're not designing? Um, going back to what, what truly got me interested in, in war gaming were the American Heritage Series games. Hmm. I don't know if you recall them, uh, Broadsides, um, Hit the Beach. There was a Civil War game, which I have, and I can't, oh, Battle Cry. Yeah. And Dog Fight. Those, those were yes. the four uh, um, heritage games. <clears throat> and I must have played those to death when I was in grade school. <laughs> what am I playing now? Um, yeah. Well, actually, I'm playtesting for a, um, a new company, uh, a game called Vo Votes for Women. Mm. And it is a history of the suffragette movement. And uh, I, I wish I could remember the name of the company. Um, they put out uh, their first game on the, uh, the Pirates I that, saw this. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Is it, um, shoot, I saw this too. Someone in the comments may know. I wanted to say, was it, uh, was it, it's not PSC, is it Plastic Soldier Company? No. Who no. Is? Somebody in the comments may know. Let me see. If I, could, I could leave you briefly and I could go grab the copy of the game. But at any rate, 
this uh, this votes for women is uh, is currently um, pretty polished. They're just working on the balance because uh, so far it seems like the suffragettes are sweeping it. Mm. But the anti-suffragette player uh, uh, comes in and reflects all of the actions that were done uh, by those that were trying desperately to keep women from getting the vote. And the game is played on a map of the United States. And you are jockeying for influence in all the various states. Uh, there's an early stage, a middle stage, and a late stage. And in the early stage, uh, the West are simply territories. And it follows uh, very historically in that initially, everybody is against uh, um, giving women the vote and then gradually it builds. Mm. And you have to deal with Congress and getting the, um, uh, the recommendation on the floor. Great game. Well, I know Bleeding Kansas really a lot of, uh, I was talking to somebody that loved playing that said it's got definitely a voting the voting feel and yes. pushing, yeah, and and they were saying, oh, it's so instructional even to see and understand how what they were really pushing for is to maximize the votes in different areas. And can I tell you a secret, please. I wanted so badly for Kansas to pick that up and and use it in their schools. Yeah, yeah, you would think never, it never happened, but oh well. Do you think they were, were they nervous just because one faction is anti-slavery and one's pro? I was nervous about that. <laughs> but I honestly, um, I never got any flack about that. Um, one of my first designs, uh, King Philip's work, got a lot of flack across, uh, across the state, across the nation, mm. across the world. I had people protesting all over, the, literally walking up and down a sidewalk with signs saying, ban this game. Really? And I kind of expected something like that out of Bleeding Kansas, but it didn't happen. Huh. Because, I mean, well, I'm an avid reader, <clears throat> but the idea of banning books is very much the same for me if somebody bans a game. What you're saying is the thought or these thoughts or these historical moments, whether it's a game or a book, somehow should be banned and that should tell any free loving person that's not the way to go especially when you're as true to history as you've been, as you've been. thank you for saying that because i try to be um but i i should explain a little a little bit more the protest began um through a an associate professor out of connecticut hmm. um, uh, this was a conflict, uh, King Philip's War, that took place up in New England. And uh, I contacted a newspaper in Rhode Island saying, this is what I'm doing. I'm sure your readers would be interested in it. And the reporter said, yes, they probably would. What I didn't know is he knew that this associate professor was all already, if, if you'll excuse the expression, on the warpath. Mm. Uh, because she felt that uh, the Indian tribes in the area had not only been overlooked, but had been looked at as being um, destroyed, gone, done with. And she was trying to revive the culture. And without looking into the design itself, um, she just looked at it as a war game to wipe out the Indians. Mm. And um, we went back and forth, and eventually we went on a radio show, a, a Rhode Island radio show, in which we gave our points, came to an amicable agreement, and the game was actually published a year earlier, uh, and afterwards, I, I heard nothing from anyone. Hmm. So again, what, what the opposition was concerned with the concept not the actual reality without really knowing the the basis of it yes sadly <laughs> sadly we see that on occasion huh. no i mean 
exactly right because I was even talking. My son's fourteen, and we're usually um, talking over well over the summer. I had him reading through the U.S. Constitution, and then we were working through the amendments. And Good for you, I, oh, I love it. Well, it's funny he came to me because my wife usually has him work do a workbook over the summer for the next grade he's going into. And it's very, of course, you know, very regimented and very nice. And it works, serves as a primer to get him ready and refreshed. And he, he went and told her, I don't want to do that. And I said, um, what if we try some reading and thought exercises, you know, along the way, rather than just the, the workbook, which we've done for years, which has worked well. And she said, all right, give it a shot. And it was funny because he was pushing back a little bit, but he read Animal Farm. Uh, when I had him read Animal Farm, yeah, we started with that, and then we moved into the U.S. Constitution, and then we discussed. But when he got to the three-fifths clause, I was curious. I said, you know, what do you pick up in there? And he said, well, I'm not sure I understand exactly, you know, this whole three-fifths clause and what's going on. And we spent a good probably 45 minutes, and I wanted him to understand why it was placed in there in the first place and who placed it you know why would folks that want slavery abolished before a three-fifths of a person clause and why would slave owners want a full person listed and let him puzzle through and you know of course he says well well they wanted more power they wanted to maintain the slavery i go there you go so it's not as easy as uh, I got a good buddy uh, who's African American that that you know got fired up and and knew I liked history, and we'd spent well it took me about five minutes to point out the fallacy of of that three fifths as not three fifths of a person it was folks actually trying to help abolish slavery. But <laughs> well, so what you what you are talking about. Uh, the compromise, um, the the uh, the ridiculousness of it all, mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to bring out in the series that I'm writing. Mm. Um, every every book is a standalone book, but it's but it's also a continuation from the year prior to the war into the Grant administration, and I'm trying to bring out those aspects of history that have been swept under the rug, or that are just too little understood. Yeah. And um, I try to bring in as much African American uh, involvement as possible. Beautiful, yeah, because uh, knowledge is power. So, yeah. and understanding, hundred percent. Well, speaking of that, let's see what some of the comments have been here. Uh, we'll, we'll see what we've got here. Oh, here's a here's a good one that I need to read. Uh, could you ask John if his company ever takes submissions from independent game designers? I created a solo game, The Drifter. It's essentially a Western uh, barbarian prince. So, sounds like an interesting topic. Um, I, I think that you could find a company that that would be interested in it. I don't have a company. Um, I I call what I do. Um, uh, after after my my wife, uh, who supports me in everything that I do, but mm. I, it's really not a game company. I I deal with eight different companies, and I only developed relationships with them over uh, the course of two decades. Uh, I'm not going to tell you it's easy to break in. Um, I can tell you the best way to break in is not to. Um, send something to a company blind, um, but to visit with uh, the principles of companies at um, at <laughs> the, the conventions. Oh yeah, sure. Go, go to gaming conventions. Yeah, like uh, WBC. Find out find out who's in charge because as much as you want to sell your game, your game idea. Um, the game companies are looking for new ideas mm -hmm. and they are willing to listen. If you come up with a good idea, they'll take you up on it. Beautiful. Vorpal had a question here. Um, let's see. Does the, does this cool game include historical personalities like Indian chiefs and Indian fighters? Yes, absolutely. Um, each deck um, 
is, uh, if I, <laughs> I'm working on so many things, I'm going to probably get it wrong, but I believe the decks are 15 cards a piece, and each one is a historical personality or event. Mm. Beautiful. I know Kabuki Kid, when we were referencing the Birth of America series, 1775 Rebellion is her favorite. I think mine too. I'm with you, Kabuki. Yeah. I like the way that Brits can just pop in with their, their ships into different areas. And um, what the, um, oh, their first one, and I'm going to blank on the name, it was much more about maneuver and movement. And 1775 yes. was much more about rapid and sudden combat. Let's see. Okay, good. I've caught up. Let me work back down here. I knew I'd missed a couple. Uh, Uva says, gorgeous rules. I agree. They did a wonderful job bringing in that Native American style as well. Let's see. Uh, Vorpal says, who gets Calamity Jane? <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody, but maybe we'll bring her in in, in uh, um, an addition later. There you go. Perfect. Let's see. What do we got? Uh, um, there was some talk over specialty dice and things. Vorpal feels like he has a tendency, I'm going to, I'm ad living here, to lose dice. Apparently, he's a crazy roller and he fears that if he were to lose one of these specialty dice, it would be hard to replace. Kabuki says she's fine with specialty dice and she never loses them. Well, good <laughs> for you. And, and Vorpal, I have to tell you that GMT is a true, uh, I, I want to say a really nice adjective, and I can't think of one nice enough. Sure. When you deal with GMT, if you need something, you got it. So you yeah. lose the dice, they'll get it to you. And don't feel bad about losing dice. Um, my friend Rick uh, Young taught me that to train dice, you have to throw them very hard against a wall. <laughs> there you go. There you go. We've got uh, Pete says, so glad that Plains Indians Indian Wars is becoming a reality. I love the Birth of America series. Really excited to hear uh, this will have a solo mode. He also loved Hearts and Minds. Well, thank you very much, Pete. Um, the, this, the solo modes, I can't say enough nice things about. There are actually four different solo modes. Very nice. How, if you don't mind, uh, just kind of roughly, how are they slightly different? Is it just you're playing different sides? Playing different sides, correct. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Ron, good buddy of mine, been on the, uh, helps me with. Oh, good for you. Good yeah. for you, yeah. It's nice to break that out every now and then. Perfect. Ron just went through a big move. Let's see, um, uh, let's see, original squad leader, some of the stuff they still play. I wish I could help. Um, let's see. Oh, it just jumped on me. I'm trying to bring up some of these here. Um, uh, While you're doing that, I'd, I'd like to plug some of the other games that I um, hope to see published within the next oh, three absolutely. quarters of a year to year. Um, La, La Vendee um, was just published by ATO, which was the counter revolution to the French Revolution mm. um, in uh, the west of France. Um, I have Berlin Airlift and Fire on the Mountain, my version of this, the Battle of South Mountain, mm. uh, which will be coming out with Legion War Games. Beautiful. Planks of Gettysburg which are the, the two rises on either end of the Union Fishhook, Culp's Hill and Little Round Top. Okay. Um, Pontiac's War, which is the latest version in my, my series on um, American Indian Wars. Um, and that one is particularly interesting because it follows hot on the heels of the French and Indian War just prior to the Revolutionary War. And it actually, uh, some people think, um, was one of the reasons for the Revolutionary War. Hmm. Because the English were unable to protect the settlers from the Indian Rising. And in fact, were the ones that actually started it by their treatment of the Indians after they had beaten the French. Hmm. 
I also have uh, Wolf Tones Rising coming out with, with Compass, which is the 1798 um, Irish Rising, in which the French actually played a part and could have played a much larger part had it not been for the weather. Hmm. Um, and finally, Mountain Men will be coming out with Columbia. Mountain Men is a, um, a beer and pretzels game on the uh, uh, history of trappers and trapping in, in the Rockies. Wow, very interesting. I grew up, uh, well, I, I was born in Wichita, but when I was seven, we moved to Evergreen, Colorado, up into the mountains. It's about 45 minutes to an hour west of the, the Denver suburbs. And it was interesting because I found that there was a mountain man game, and I can't remember the, the designer. He kind of does these self-published things. But uh, he used, and I still have to play it, he used a lot of the source of the Nile um, kind of rules. And he includes crayons because you're, you're drawing along this, this map as you're exploring and things. And, uh, and I was, I've been trying to pick up source of the Nile. Um, Kabuki Kid says 1812 was the game I was looking at. Yes, that's the first in the Birth of America series. So... And then Glowing Turtle wanted to say thanks uh, to both you and I for actually fielding his question. So you've got a lot of irons in the fire. Um, what drives your, um, your design? Is it that you've read something or taught on something and you're like, yes, I think I, I know a way, a mechanic that would get me into this history? My background is, is largely in history. I grew up in Springfield, Illinois, which is Lincoln's stomping ground mm. when, he, when he was uh, first getting into politics. Um, my my um, bachelor's is in history out of the University of West Florida. My master's is in history out of Shippensburg University here in Pennsylvania. Mm. Um, I taught a variety of historical classes in an alternative school. And I do a lot of historical reading, books, magazines. And if I run across something that I'm not familiar with, uh, something that has just been touched on elsewhere, but I'm given more detail, I, I want to share that. If I'm excited about it, I know others will be as well. Hmm. And I have right now have to be um, about 50 designs on the shelf that have not seen uh, publishing. May never, but if I get an idea, unless I work on it, it drives me crazy. Ah, I love that. So so an idea will hit you and you'll kind of flush it out a little. You ever put something on the shelf and then three years later, you're like, oh, this that mechanic is what I was needing. Yeah, yeah. Got Love it. You know, it's the same thing with with my writing. Um, I write a chapter a week, mm. and in the process, I usually divide the chapter up into two or three sections. I'll get to work on. Uh, I'll have a general idea of what I want. Honestly, I know how the history ends, but I have no idea where my characters are going. Love it. I look at at a timeline of the Civil War, I look at what's happening in the US and around the world, and I try to tie my characters' drives and their situations um, to match what's going on in the world. So I'm never really quite sure what, what's happening, but in in the process of writing, I'll, I'll come to what others might call uh, writer's block, and I don't look at it as that. I look at it as feeding it into the hopper, the brain, mm -hmm. and I go do something else. I'll play a game. I'll, I'll read. And a day or two later, the answer is there. Hmm. So back uh, to spend some more time on, on your books and your writing, are th these are fictional, historically set books, or are these more treatises just walking through the history? You say characters. So uh, what, what are you doing exactly with it's, your It's a fictional series that is heavily historically based. Hmm. I spend three times more time researching than I do actually writing. Hmm. Um, one of my favorite chapters in the first novel 
is uh, where one of my characters leaves Baltimore, goes to Charleston, and attends the uh, the Democratic convention there. And this is where the Democrats split into the Northern Democratic Party and then and the Southern Democratic Party. And you go through all 10 days mm. and how he goes there, super excited, super enthusiastic. And by the time he leaves, he can't wait to leave because it, it seems like in politics, all people do is argue. And at one point he goes to the convention after I think six or seven days, he goes there drunk because yeah. he's, he's just so tired of it. And I'm trying to get the reader to see what is happening, how people came to this impasse, which is so similar to where we are today. Yeah. Name, it, name your series again. It's called Snake Bit, S-N-A-K-E-B-I-T. It's on Amazon. I only have one book published so far because it had to be self-published. Sure. I'm trying to get a publisher um, interested so I can get the other books out. But um, I'm not stopping writing. Sure. Beautiful. Now, Vorpal has a question, too. So, John, uh, you ever create a book and game combination or like a tie-in? Have you ever done that? I have not. Um, but if you ever do read the series, you will see many of the aspects uh, that I put in my um, several Civil War designs. Uh, um, Lincoln's War, Belmont. Um, <laughs> I can't remember them all. Hmm. And then we've got uh, Ron here. Ron says, when I mentioned irons in the fire, that equals an arsonist golfer. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Ron and is sharp. And it's just with your name, Mr. Nicholson. Yes. See this. Perfect, Ron. Great. Wonderful. All right. Well, I love that. This is, this is just uh, awesome. Is there anything else? you wanted to cover that I haven't asked. I know I told you we'd try to keep it around 45 minutes. A sign that it's so good is that we're actually at 53 minutes. So thanks for even hanging in longer than I promised. Um, for what it's worth, I would like to ask your listeners what they most enjoy in a game. What do you look for when you, when you um, purchase a game? Uh, what do you expect? Beautiful. Get some ideas. So as these come in, throw those in there. And as they come in, I will pull them up. I will tell you, I'll start, I'll answer from my version. I love the feeling that I'm, I'm able to somehow immerse myself at a point where I'm playing within the history. Mm. And, and when I get a game that then steers me toward um, even a deeper understanding. So right now I have here I stand from GMT on my table. And that led me to, um, oh, is it Will Durant? Durant's series on uh, the, the, the story of civilization. And he has, yes. and I picked up the Reformation and began to read through because just looking over the cards, of course, here I stand, has got that CDG thing going on for some of the, the history tie in, some of it. But it, that, that alone, as I was even learning it, drove me toward the Reformation, which I hadn't studied. And so for me personally, um, when a game, I've, I've, I've hit games from different ways. Sometimes, like World War II is where I began, and I loved, I was reading about World War II. It was actually at my sixth grade teacher sparked my interest in, in reading. Uh, Mr. Reibel, per, well done. Uh, I, I thought, here's me. I thought reading when I was in fifth grade or fourth grade was for girls because I had to read Charlotte's Web. And I thought, come on. And uh, and it was and I was so stubborn that I would have to come home and read out loud to my parents, which I despised. I was like, oh, this is terrible. And then Mr. Reibel came up with a, a reading worm. First day of sixth grade, he had construction paper on the wall. And he said, every time you read a book, I'm going to write your name on another circled piece of construction paper. 
and we'll put it up on the wall and we'll try to wrap it around the entire classroom by the end of the year. What a idea. Yeah, just sparked my interest. And I remember to this day, it's so, I remember thinking, well, that sounds neat, but I bet you there's no books for me. And then almost like he's in my head, he goes, hey, I've got a box of books in the back that are a little bit different than uh, normal. And I, I literally remember thinking, I'll take a look, but I bet you there's nothing. And I was thumbing through this box and I run across this yellow covered uh, book called My Brother Sam is Dead. And it's a Revolutionary War soldier kind of in profile with his musket written by the Collier brothers. And I thought, wow, dead. You know, I've never even <laughs> seen a book that would mention this. And I read it. And it was, of course, historically based. And it was the first time I got into the character and understood. And uh, so I thank you. Mr. Mark. Yeah, I actually got lucky right before I moved to Wichita for the police job. I knew I had the gig. I ran into him at this mall. And, oh, wow. uh, yeah, he'd been retired. And I remember kind of yelling out his name just because I wasn't sure. And he turned and we chatted. It's funny. I'm six foot six now. And I said, do you remember me? And I, you know, I mean, he had years and years of kids. And he says, well, I can tell you this. You're much bigger than I remember. <laughs> and we chatted and I got a chance to tell him, hey, I am an avid reader. So for me, I started reading a lot of uh, Bantam books on Tarawa, on the, you know, on 12 o'clock or B-17s and Black Friday. And my very first game was B-17, Queen of the Skies, a solitaire game. But I thought, oh, this looks like it's kind of like a, a book, but a game I can get into. And boy, did I, you know, Avalon Hill hit that out of the park with me. And I that just. Was, um, that was my son's favorite game. Oh. He, he actually did very well at it in, uh, in uh, competition. Um, he was a Marine as well. Um, luckily, he came in between the two Iraqi conflicts. Mm. So he didn't, he didn't uh, see any blood. He lost some friends in it, though. Um, sure. My father was also a Marine. He was on Guadalcanal in the wow. uh, in the second wave. Holy <clears throat> man. Got shot off a telephone pole and recovered in uh, the North Island of New Zealand. Whew. Lordy. All right, back to your topic here. Um, so, of course, Vor Vorpal starts with simply winning, not quite what we're looking for. <laughs> but let's okay. see. He then adds that uh, he he loves or he likes miniature games, uh, so he likes to show off just as much as playing. Okay, still Vorpal. By, by miniatures, do you mean um, uh, three three dimensional pieces? And and if you do, I totally agree with you. Hmm. Okay, I think he does. We'll get we'll see what he has in follow up. We'll get to that. Uh, Uva has a, a game that creates. A good narrative is always appreciated. Uh, Queen of the Skies comes to mind. Yeah, B-17, Queen of the Skies, the narrative. I will tell you, I, I ran into doing my show. I had a commenter once, um, and who knows where he or she was even coming from. Um, but she said, you know, how can you promote war? And I, I answered a response, and I said, you know, my very first game I played when I was 13, B-17, Queen of the Skies, taught me so much more about the horrors of war. It was amazing how I got attached to these men on these B-17s, completely fictional, yet as the story unfolded and they were killed or wounded or maimed, or, I mean, it was just, there were a couple times, you know, I'd almost complete a mission, several missions in with the plane and the plane goes down. I remember I'd go, I'm done playing for today. I can't even play anymore. Yeah. And, and even when I went into the military, it gave me such a more realization of the horrors of war. So the idea that it a game means disrespect or play, or it's completely the opposite. It's a deeper understanding is what I usually say. Um, Ron uh, says, uh, uh, sub substantive decision-making. A game that is overly Yahtzee-ish works against this. So he likes making those important decisions or having important decisions to make i agree and and one of the things that i've learned uh, as a designer is the more 
options given to the player, mm. um, the greater his enjoyment. Um, the other thing I learned is don't punish the player too often. Mm. So uh, the more rewards that, that are included, the better. Beautiful. Uba has uh, Ambush and Battle Him. Also tell good stories, 100%. Yeah. Um, and uh, Battle Him even had their spinoff called Leatherneck. I know what that means. <laughs> Marine, um, my, my son and I just got through um, publishing a game with Worthington Games called uh, Devil Dogs, uh, Bella mm. Wood. Oh. And it, the only other design I could find on the battle <laughs> went back to, I think, 70, 75, 76. So mm. it was time. And that and that one was, uh, well, it was very much like the uh, war games that came out in the 60s, pretty, pretty plain Jane. Okay. Um, he came up with some amazing um, ideas and and our collaboration worked very well so there, there's a game you might look into mm, awesome what's it called again it's called devil dogs of bella wood okay vorpal answers that uh, yes he does yes yes he does like those miniatures he had a follow-up here with 60 millimeter uh vietnam war pewter <laughs> figures purchased from hong kong Wow. Um, we've got uh, the tanks and helicopters are crowd pleasers. And That's true. Yeah. And my favorite company is King and Country, I guess, for those items. Interesting. Very nice. Very nice. Well, John, again, thank you so much for joining me on a Saturday. This has it's been great. Blessed. Yeah. Time's, I always know when it's a great interview is when I look up and I'm like, whoa, time is flying by here. Thank you. And thank if you, you for the ever, and thank you all for, for uh, joining us. Yeah, thank you. And if you ever want to come back on, if you're getting ready to put something out or you even got a great design that you just want folks to see what you've got out there, you let me know. And I love doing these interviews. I really do. So, I can tell. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you for coming on. <laughs> All right. I'm going to close up the show. John, hang on for a second. We're going to hit the end broadcast here. Let me check and make sure I didn't miss any last second comments. Uh, nope, we're good. Uh, my apologies if I missed anybody's comments in the stream. I'm always trying to, you know, pay attention to multiple things. So if I missed a question, my apologies. Um, there are some thanks coming in. Uh, Uva, uh, thanks, gentlemen. Time well spent. And uh, Vorpal, Thanks for sharing. So we'll end with that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.